this will be brief. A lot of the anatomy has already been covered. Uh, and Joe has talked a little bit about the indications for tackling the proximal pole. So I think one of the issues still remains on what exactly would be the proximal pole fracture. I'll talk a little bit about the anatomy, some management principles and show uh, a case just to show the surgical approach. Now this is a, a, a micro CT scan image. So when I was in Arkansas at the University of Arkansas, we used a micro CT to image scaphoids and so we could get a detailed view of the anatomy. And uh, when you compare that with this study from Compson, which he published in the JBJS, and Compson tried to define what the proximal pole of the scaphoid is. And if you look at literature, some people call it proximal third, which is probably almost a uh, waist. Some call it the proximal 25%, and uh, uh, Compson called it the edge of the capitate, and now Joe, through the paper by Singh, I've talked more about calling it the proximal 20%. And what Compson said was, so what Compson did, he took these plasticine models of uh, scaphoids on CT, then he put them on a plain X-ray of a broken scaphoid, and following the pattern on a plastic bone, turning it around 360, you kind of realize what the pattern is throughout the bone. And what he said was, if the fracture line is proximal to the scaphocapitate articulation, that is probably a true definition of a proximal pole fracture right there. So the fragment, as you can see, on different views appears different sized. Now, when we did the micro CT, what we found was the proximal pole has the most dense trabeculae, really thick trabeculae. So it's got the best bone in the scaphoid. And in fact, if you look at the uh, number of trabeculae, the bone volume, and uh, other aspects of trabecular thickness, the intertrabecular distance, and the bone volume, you realize that the proximal pole has the best bone, so good screw purchase. And when you look at the blood supply, which Amit showed really well, we know that the supply mainly comes in a retrograde fashion, and there is very little, if any, blood vessels getting in here. Although uh, uh, this paper, from Germany done by anatomists on frozen cadavers, I'm sorry, on embalmed cadavers, seem to feel that there are some consistent volar blood supplies to the scaphoid, but uh, I'm not sure that has taken on much in uh, surgical literature. What was interesting was when we looked at the micro CT and we looked at the trabecular pattern, it follows the blood vessels that Gelberman uh, showed in the intra supply in 1980. So clearly, there are trabeculae and blood vessels go along the trabeculae into this proximal pole. And when you get a fracture here, you can see why you may end up cutting off the blood supply to this thick, dense bone. And hence, when it goes avascular, delayed healing, you can understand why it can easily fragment because it becomes a real brittle piece of bone. Uh, we did some studies uh, uh, previously on the measurements of the scaphoid. And one important thing to remember, when you're looking at the proximal pole of the scaphoid, and you're going to put a screw across that bone, very important to remember that in a female, the bone is only about under four millimeters wide, and in a male, it's just under five millimeters wide. So whatever screw you're putting in from a proximal to distal fashion, you have to have an idea of how big that bone is so that your screw doesn't split that fragment as you're putting it in an anti-grade fashion to fix that. And so what I did is just looked at the current screws that are available and uh, to see what the diameter of the screws are. So if you're doing a proximal pole fracture, a really small piece, you probably will be using something like an Acumed Micro, especially in a female where the scaphoid is gonna be about three millimeters, you want to only use a 2.5 millimeter uh, a micro screw. And you can see the trailing end of the screw is 2.8, so that becomes a mini would become big and a standard would break the scaphoid in a female. The KLS Martin, again, it's interesting that the trailing end, the screw is wider than the leading end. So again, there, you would have to use something small and perhaps the only one that would be appropriate would be maybe a Medartis, which is 2.2 the whole way through, or a Synthes, which is 1.5 the whole way through for really small fragments. And I will sometimes use a fragment, a screw from the handset, a non-cannulated 
uh, headed screw that I will bury under the cartilage, which I will show you in a minute. Now, this paper also came from uh, Joe Dias's group, and they looked at uh, this meta-analysis of scaphoids treated non-operatively. And of the 1147 published in literature, only 5% were proximal. So important to remember, proximal pole is not a common problem. It's only about 6% or 10% of cases. But what they found was 34% non-union rate when they were managed non-operatively. And so according to this paper from uh, looking at previous reports in literature, your relative risk of a non-union compared to a scaphoid waist fracture is much higher with a proximal pole, 7.5 times higher. So when you are looking at a patient with a proximal pole fracture, poor blood supply, dense bone, higher likelihood of non-union, almost 7.5 times. So this is something you want to take into consideration when you're choosing between uh, operative uh, or non-operative management. The only paper that kind of supports non-operative treatment is the one from Canada by Ruby Grewal. And what Ruby showed was they looked at five years uh, or seven years of their uh, cohort of scaphoid fractures that came through their unit. And in their study, 16% were proximal pole. Now what's interesting in this paper, they did not define what is proximal pole. 25%, 30%, 20%, I suspect they, they perhaps included some what we might call a proximal waste because they said they had, a, you, they had a incidence of 16%, quite high. And what's interesting is of their patients treated in a cast, 90% united assessed by CT, which was very similar to the union rate for waste fractures. And they found, however, that the time to union was a bit longer. So about three months in a cast. Once again, as we know with all scaphoid fractures, what are the chances of non-union? What increases the chances? Fracture translation. So again, they said, if a proximal pole fracture of the scaphoid is not moved or there is no displacement on a CT scan, you have a 90% chance of union if you put it in a cast. However, if there's translation or you see a cyst or there's any evidence of comminution of the fragment, you should consider surgery because then there, there's a risk of getting non-union. Now, I just want to show one case uh, to show the surgical technique. So if you have a proximal pole and you decide you want to fix it, this is the approach you would use. Now, if you look at this case, unfortunately, I did not do CT scans on this patient. So this is a case from about 15 years ago. And you can see the proximal pole, there's a double shadow. So we we're already suspicious that there may be some combination of that proximal pole. Secondly, when you look at the lateral view, you realize the lunate is in DC. So this is another way to define instability of a scaphoid fracture is if on the lateral view, you have signs of carpal collapse. The approach kind of follows the track of the EPL tendon. So the EPL runs like this. This approach is kind of curved in that fashion. Now, once you open it, you can see we've opened a flap of capsule. This is a flap of capsule that's been elevated. These are the wrist extensor tendons. Here's the EPL tendon. So now you can see the scaphoid and the fracture is somewhere around here. So as we remove the synovium and the, and the little blood, blood there, just go back a bit. First thing we realize is it looks like a displaced fracture, right? You can see there's a little bit of a cortical step. Next, when we put some wires to get mobility and to try to align the fractures, we realize now there's a coronal split in that proximal pole fragment. So now we've got some wires holding everything together. Now a single cannulated screw in this case would be inserted from here and that's right into the plane of that fracture. So in this case, what we ended up doing was putting a screw across from here and one screw from here to get stability. And so we used one screw that was in this fashion that you can see here. And this was a two millimeter screw. And this is from the handset. And the other screw was inserted across from here into this fragment. 
and that's a 1.5 millimeter screw. Now, if you have a headed screw, it's not a big deal because using a countersink, you can bury the screw uh, beneath the articular cartilage, as you can see there. And uh, this patient went on to unite, and you can see we've restored uh, stability in the wrist uh, on that view. Now, the problem with putting a screw in the proximal pole, this is where you have to be careful. Number one, you can split the fragment, and we've all done this. And especially if you're doing a case that's delayed or avascular, the bone is very brittle. I would recommend only use a mini or even a micro screw. Remember, the screw should definitely not be more than three millimeters in the trailing edge, or you'll split the screw as you do the final tightening. Because we are doing a dorsal approach, if you haven't flexed the wrist enough and you're approaching the scaphoid from the dorsal aspect, you could end up putting a screw to dorsal and not get the center of the fragment. So it's important to flex the wrist quite a lot so that you can get down the middle and your screw will capture, uh, better capture that fragment. If you're using a conical screw, be careful, it might split it. So be careful of the trailing end of the screw. Oftentimes, when you're putting a screw in the scaphoid, and this is a view in the coronal plane, if you start your screw entry here, what will happen is as you keep inserting the screw to bury the head, you end up losing your purchase on that screw. So when you're treating a proximal pole fracture, very important to start inserting your screw at the scaphalonate ligament here, right there. That way, when you bury your screw, you're still well within the fragment. If you start away from the scaphalonate ligament, you'll start to get into the edge of the fragment. And before you know it, you don't have a good fixation. So these are some of the key points to bear in mind technically if you're gonna fix these fractures. So what would I recommend, especially if you're treating a proximal pole? CT scan. If there is any displacement, probably you should be fixing it not suitable for a cast. Proximal pole fracture, as Joe earlier said, it's probably the one indication where you should consider early fixation simply because if you're gonna put it in a cast, it will take 10 to 12 weeks to heal. So your patient has to be prepared to sign up for a longer period of immobilization. If you're going to do an approach to fix it, it's not a big surgery. The scaphoid is right there. You're not cutting any critical ligaments because you're going in that little window between those two ligaments that Amit showed you. So it's a nice small window, you can get good access. However, remember, use micro screws. And if there is comminution, you can use smaller handset screws, simply bury the head beneath the cartilage. Thank you, Sudhir.